You're an Get the out of here. Oh! For the past 10 years, the reality TV show Shark Tank has entertained and edified millions of viewers by dramatizing how entrepreneurs pitch venture capitalists. And none of the sharks, the investors who compete with each other to fund businesses they think might be successful, is more entertaining or edifying than Kevin O'Leary, whose signature insult to unsuccessful contestants, you you're, dead dead to you're dead to me, has become a pop culture catchphrase. I should have invested in that company. You're dead to me, and you are, because I'm out. But O'Leary isn't just a small screen blowhard. Born and raised in Canada, the 65-year-old investor got rich by developing educational and family-oriented computer software in the 80s and 90s. You can sure keep the customers happy. Holding firm to a gospel of thrift, savings, and reinvestment that he's outlined in best-selling books such as Cold Hard Truth on Men, Women, and Money. Over the years, he's diversified his investments into vineyards, storage facilities, and much more, and he's dabbled in politics, too, briefly considering a run in 2017 to head the Conservative Party in his native Canada. Justin Trudeau is going to elect Kevin O'Leary. He just has to keep doing what he's doing. He's incompetent. His brash nature earned him easy comparisons to Donald Trump, but O'Leary, who lives now in Boston, is openly free trade and pro-immigration. He's also long been in favor of marijuana legalization and gay rights and opposed to military interventionism. Reason sat down with O'Leary at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering of libertarians in Las Vegas. We talked about why he thinks Shark Tank is so popular, why Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is so bad, and whether democratic socialism is really a threat to the free market capitalism that he says makes us richer and happier. We also talked about why he thinks Donald Trump has been great for the economy, despite a personal style he finds unappealing. Freedom. That's what money is. Kevin O'Leary, thanks for talking to Reason. Great to be here. Thank you. What explains Shark Tank's immense appeal? I mean, you guys, you've been on for 10 seasons. You, last season, you were averaging something like five and a half million people uh, per show. Uh, there's the larger Dragon's Den phenomenon, uh, which inspired it both. I mean, you were on that in Canada. It's in other countries. Why do people like Shark Tank so much? You know, I think a lot of um, what's happened here was a surprise originally to the format owners, Sony, Mark Burnett at MGM, and certainly Disney, who owns ABC. We had no idea this would happen. And indeed, for the first three years, uh, the show was right on the bubble, mm. whether it would be continue or not. And then it went geometric in its fourth season, exploded. You know, I always tell people, what are you watching um, when you're watching Shark Tank? Because, you know, I, I tape those episodes and I watch it too because I'm always interested to see how the editors cut that one and a half hour pitch down to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. You're watching the pursuit of freedom. And it's a visceral, powerful thing to watch people have dreams and pursue them. And every once in a while, we make millionaires. Not all the time. It's very hard to, to run a business, but but we've made many, many millionaires on Shark Tank. And that is extremely visceral and powerful and magnetic. And our fastest growing demographic, demographic right now is nine to 18 year old women. Hmm. And who would have ever thought that would happen? I always think of it too, as it's, it's kind of like Ben Franklin's autobiography where he's explaining to his son, you know, this is how I made my way in the world. You're, I mean, you're demystifying how you start a business or what goes into a business. And I mean, it's very educational. How hard yeah. it is to run a business and how difficult and how challenging and how a life changer it is and it's not easy. And uh, people are understanding the entrepreneurial journey is not for everybody. But for those that are pursuing it, they're extremely interested in it. You practice a kind of form or you embody a form of, of capitalism and entrepreneurship with, without romance. Um, you say, you know, what are the numbers? You're dead to me. You know, I want money. Uh, <laughs> where does that come from? I'm a little right wing of Attila the Hun. And um, I believe that business, the DNA of a business is to provide to its constituents. Clearly, customers come number one, number two, employees. Um, somewhere in there are the shareholders. And lastly, you who started it, you're the last. Mm. Um, but when you try and shift a business's true purpose and say that it's going to save society, you will fail. Not some of the time, 100% of the time. Saving baby whales is not what businesses do. And now as people try and contort them to do that, they will find out. And we have this debate. I teach a lot of graduating cohorts of engineers and business students. And this is the, the primary debate we have is when you go out into the world, if you think your job is to solve all of society's problems, you will get fired. Unless you start delivering value to customers and shareholders and employees, the rest of the world 
That's not your problem. Your problem is taking care of your business. We're speaking at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, an annual convention. You're here to debate John Mackey, the Looking CEO to and, and John co-founder needs my help. Yeah, of Whole he Foods. Needs guidance. He talks about conscious capitalism and, and the model he puts forward, he's very successful uh, as well. What What's wrong with that idea of conscious capitalism where he seems to talk and, and now that I actually the way you're talking about it, he talks about multiple stakeholders, but he also says, you know, profit comes first because without profit, there's nothing. But what's wrong with a kind of fuzzier form of capitalism? In fact, um, if you read Mackey's principles, um, the four pillars that he espouses, much of what he's talking about are important management skills. And I agree with him on that. Where he gets lost and where we'll, we'll have the core of our debate today is in the greater purpose, because think about this problem. You have a phenomenally successful business that is global, and you're, you decide that you have a cause, that you want to be an environmentalist, or you want to save a certain part of society, or there's some medical disease you want to give to as a CEO. Why does the constituency or headquarters matter? Why doesn't the customer base in India or, or in China, or if you are trying to do something sustainable that may be irrelevant to customers in Cambodia? And so that's why it becomes really difficult to pursue mandates that are outside of the core principles of growing profits. Mm. And the more you take shareholders' capital and redeploy it away from their pockets, the higher your cost of capital is going to be. Because shareholders, and I'm an investor, I covet managers that deliver me high returns with low risk. That's what the whole core of capitalism is. And when you try and say it's something else, not only is, is it dangerous, but you're 100% wrong. Mm. That's not how it works. We have 200 years of proof that that's how it doesn't work. Are you, are you anti-philanthropy? No. Uh, or it's, so it's more that you make your money in business and then when you have your causes or your wealth, you can help with that? Let me give you an example. Let's say I can invest in two financial services companies. Um, and one of them decides, the CEO decides that he wants to support uh, a charity. And he wants to give $100 million to that charity across four quarters. Now, it's not my charity. My family supports multiple charities, but none of the ones that I support, he is supporting. My message to him or her is, you deliver me my profits. I will decide which charities I want to support. You have no right to do that on my behalf. I don't agree with you. I don't care what you like. You should take your portion of your salary or the stock you own and the dividends you get and you deploy it the way you want. The core of the business is to deliver profits to the shareholders who then will redeploy it in any way they wish. And when you lose that mandate, when you, when you misunderstand that, I'll fire you if I'm a shareholder. That's what I want to do. In preparing for this, I've read a, and, and watched a bunch of interviews with you. You are a big defender of capitalism. What, what is the best defense of capitalism as an economic and cultural system? It provides a standard of living for society in a way that has never been done before in the history of mankind. There was a time when the majority of people on earth were illiterate and they were starving and capitalism changed all of that. And certainly John admits that in his own writing. Sure. And now we're trying to do capitalism 2.0 when there's nothing wrong with capitalism 1.0. Volatility is inherent in a capitalist society. There are haves and have nots. There's those that are very good at entrepreneurship and get end up with more because they solve more problems. And some people have a problem with that, but, but capitalism can't fix that. There's nothing you can do anytime you attempt to redistribute wealth outside of the bounds of the capitalistic mandate. Mm -hmm. Countries like Canada are flailing as a result of that. Socialism doesn't work, we know that already. Um, you could end up like Cuba. But are you, are you then, are you like Ebenezer Scrooge? Uh, and where, you know, are there no poor houses? Um, when you say redistribute, what, what's the limit of, you, do you believe in a social safety net? I do actually. Yeah. I think it's the role of government to provide basic services um, I look at all the different models. I travel the world. I'm particularly fond of what they do in Switzerland, uh, where they basically have multiple tiers of things like health care and, and support for those that are poor. But what they do is they'll say, okay, if you're a wealthy Swiss citizen in the canton of Geneva and Vaux, and you want to get an MRI because you want one tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, you're going to pay for it. They're going to take the proceeds of that and they're going to redeploy it into purchasing more MRI machines 
so that the social safety net for those that aren't as fortunate can get free MRIs. I'm a big advocate of that. In Canada, where they try and make everybody equal, a dog gets an MRI first before a human. It's absurd. People wait months for hip replacements or cataract surgery. It's, it's a disaster. If you, have, if you have catastrophic illness there, yes, you jump to the head of the queue. The only other way you can get medical services to buy it in basically an illicit scheme, which I think is outrageous. So to me, I'm a huge advocate of social nets. The British have a good mm -hmm. one. The, the Danish, the Finnish, the Swiss, the Germans have done well. Do you think the American social safety net works? It's under stress right now because it manifests itself in, in ever increasing federal debt. And so there has to be a modification um, to the healthcare system here. And there's, there's multiple ways this can be achieved. Um, I think digitization of medical records in a true form will help a lot. I think it'll be the focus of the next cycle. Uh, whoever ends up being president is gonna have to deal with it. It, it is not perfect, but not, nothing's perfect. But as a society and a market for entrepreneurs, there's no place on earth like the United States of America. So capitalism is really under attack right now. And it's from, from right-wing populists like you know Tucker Carlson on Fox News who says, oh, well, it's good at building new iPhones and game consoles, but really what, what purpose does that serve? And then you have people, Democratic Social, or Donald Trump, who is anti-free trade. Uh, he's anti-free speech, which is a net part of a free economy. Uh, then you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her social justice squad yeah. uh, that is attacking it. Are you worried about capitalism's survival? No, I'm not. Um, inherent in capitalism is not only volatility of asset prices, but volatility of political mandates. And so in, in an election cycle that is as visceral and partisan as we have now, I mean, you have a a circus going on, and it's just the nature of what Washington has turned into. By the way, I think it's a carnival freak show, not a circus, because the <laughs> circus sometimes is fun, right? Well, I, I enjoy the uh, rhetoric. It's very entertaining. Mm. It's was, not mean enough for you, though. I, no, I no, suspect it's Mr. Wonderful. I want to bring back, I was a, I'm was. i a huge history buff, and I really enjoyed history throughout my entire education. and. I had a great history teacher when I was very young in high school, and she taught me something very, very important that I've never forgot in my, in my career, and I'll, I'll give it to you here. Great politicians, great leaders, great CEOs are phenomenal entertainers. Mm -hmm. Going back to the days of Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Bismarck, they used to hold council at night, have big dinner parties, or sit around the fire with their camp, with their, with their men, and tell stories. They would tell stories of great defeats, great battles, great loves, and that would spread through the troops. You know, the leader mm -hmm. told us about this, this maneuver in the Nile yesterday, yeah. and it would capture the hearts and minds of, of the people. Donald Trump is exactly that. He is a great entertainer. He smoked the competition by eating 101% of the airtime in the last election. Unfortunate for Hillary, she was boring on television. And like Obama was, it was a different time. She didn't see that it was time to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. The best ever coverage she got was the debates with Trump where it was so mesmerizing, I actually watched that instead of football. I remember sitting with a bunch of guys golfing and we turned that on instead of a football game and I said, wow, he's, uh, he's, he's Alexander the Great. What do you, but you're also, you, you're critical of Trump in, in various ways and what do you, I mean, so he's a great storyteller, a great entertainer and that allowed him to become the leader of America and maybe the free world if we still talk about things in those terms. But you, you know, looking at, you, you had, uh, thought about running to be the head of the Conservative Party in Canada. I did. You're, you know, one of the things you were talking about, and obviously you're off Canada now. You don't right. like it as much. Well, but, that's not true, oh, but I'll, I'll detail oh, Well, that. okay, sure. but you, um, you know, you're in favor of more immigration. You are in favor of gay rights and trans rights, yes. legal weed. Yeah. Uh, you are non-interventionist, uh, yeah. generally in foreign policy. Um, what do you think of Trump substantively? You know, you have to differentiate, and, and my take on Trump and, and his, his cabinet is I don't watch the circus or the freak show, whatever you want to call it. 
I look at the policy. Mm -hmm. I'm a policy wonk. And I have this unique index I should share with you. I have interests in almost, you know, it is over 50. It's over 50 private companies now, all in practically every state. Very few states we don't have interest in now. I get the monthly cash flows of every one of these businesses because most of my deal structures are royalties, as you know, or venture mm -hmm. debt or preference shares or converts. And I have lots of covenants around cash flow. I have never in my life seen an economy like this. This is even better than the 60s. It is phenomenal. And I think primarily because of deregulation, not tax right. reform. My companies in California, in Texas, in Florida, in Illinois, in, in the, at the municipal level and the state level have been set free. What is the nature of that deregulation? Because I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. In California, I had a deal that converted strip mall you know, retail space that had failed, 1,200 square feet, and turned it into um, a place where you could paint and drink wine. Mm -hmm. And very successful business called Wine and Design. Uh, you get a painting lesson, you sip wine with your friends, you enjoy yourself for four hours. You do a painting. The regulations to actually allow people to do that included such absurd regulations. For example, a frosted glass window had to be within 21 feet of a back door that did not have frosted glass, but had bars across mm -hmm. it. And all kinds of absurd regulations have been on the books since the 50s. Well, Trump swept all that garbage away. How did he do that? Where, he, he where does that come from? He basically, anything that was a federal mandate, he just ripped it up. And mm -hmm. some of these regulations were federally mandated. And others were stripped away by states watching businesses leave and saying, wait a minute, if they're deregulating that for Texas federally, I'm going to do that on a state basis. All of a sudden, I can open up stores all across California where I never could. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And so... This has been a really interesting time over the last 36 months, and I see no slowdown. I just saw last month's numbers. Wow. I mean, I'm just... So, so now you're me, making me think it's the fall of 1929. I don't know. It's like no, you know, I, I, things I'm, can only keep going up. I'm uh, very optimistic about the domestic economy. We could have trade war issues with the S&P 500 because 46% of their sales are international. But I'll tell you this about Trump. Here's my assumption. The chance he doesn't get a second term, in my view, is zero. And I'll tell you why. I don't recall in modern times when going into a second term at full employment, the incumbent of any party has ever lost their mandate, ever. How important to you, uh, and I want to come to Canada in a second, but as in a leader like Trump, and entertaining, et cetera, but then the rhetoric is not just um, bilious. I mean, it's racist. It's... Um, extremely divisive. And of course, you know, people on the other side are, are giving him the same. Does that kind of stuff trouble you at all? Or is that just a kind of epiphenomenon? It doesn't matter. You know, I met Trump because we both worked for Mark Burnett. Mm -hmm. He was on The Apprentice. We were just starting Shark Tank. We used to meet up when we were selling the forwards in New York. It's an advertising for the networks. In many ways, his, his, his style is, uh, to, for 50% of the population, his style is difficult. Uh, he, I don't believe he's a racist man. I don't, th I don't believe that at all. Uh, I don't think he's a sexist man. I don't believe that at all, even though it's interpreted. Um, I think he's a family man, but people don't get that. Well, he's had several families, he so has. he he's obviously been likes multiple them. Times. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's a, and that's not going to change, is right. my point. This won't get better for people who don't like him. Mm -hmm. I ignore all that stuff. And, you know, I get... In, in my in my family, the night that he got elected, I told we were all sitting around. It was the you know, culmination of all that entertainment of the of the election cycle, and my daughter wept. And I said, Savannah, this is a really good thing that just happened. You just don't know it yet. She said, How can that man be elected? How can you know? It was a very divisive moment in my family. So we have in my own family people that. Our dining room discussions and, you know, Sunday night dinners are about politics. I love politics. And I keep trying to sell them on the merits of his policy. And I realize it's never going to change their opinions. America's like that, too. Yeah. My, my family is just like the average American family. So with younger people in particular, there's a ton of polls out that showing, you know, that uh, millennials or people under 40, Americans under 40, have a positive view of socialism. Some, in some polls, a more positive view of socialism than capitalism. Yeah. How do, how do you change that? Because, you know, they are going to, I mean, there's already more millennials than baby boomers. Yeah. They're, they're going to be voting at some point. 
where are they wrong and uh, how do you reach them? Not, you know, to, to convert them to capitalism. I was a socialist when I was 18 years old, too. I was left wing until I got my first paycheck and I saw something called tax on it. Everybody's a socialist when they're young until they start working and they start realizing how tough it is out there. And they start realizing how much money government wastes when they take half their income in taxes. And that's when you become a conservative. The older you get, the more realistic you become. And a majority of those people make the transition in their mid twenties. That's what happens. I never worry about it. My job today is to teach young people about the entrepreneurial journey to make sure that those that can't handle it, don't try it. Mm-hmm. I tell people, this is what it's like. I'm going to give, I'm going to do a two hour lecture. I'm going to walk you through what your life's going to be like if you pursue this. And maybe some of you should be great employees because not everybody in this room is going to make it as an entrepreneur. It's that way about life. And I think the, the, the natural cycle is the world's a kumbaya place when your parents are paying for everything for you. And then you get out of the house and you're on your own and you go, wow, it's tough out here. I read um, an interesting story about your childhood and about your mother. You're of Lebanese and Irish right, descent. Right. Um, and when your mother died, you found out that she had been investing. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the lesson that you know, that you learned from that and, sh- you know, should everybody kind of adapt that or at least take it seriously? The lesson I learned was that she, w- she had a fierce desire for financial independence. She had been married twice and she didn't want a man to rule her life financially ever. And she was a very shrewd investor. She had a portfolio of 23 large cap dividend paying stocks and telco bonds. And over a 50 year period, that portfolio beat every single manager I'd ever hired. She just believed in owning securities that returned capital to shareholders, and she would only spend the interest and dividends and never the principal. And the principal over that 50 year period appreciated wildly. And, you know, what, what it taught me um, was to focus. Here's how it manifests itself in my life today. Not some of my returns, 95% of them in this 11 year or 14 year journey on Dragon's Den and Shark Tank mm-hmm. have come from companies run by women. They are very, very good at mitigating risk. And my mother was like that. So now I'm almost sexist in the sense that even the producers have to say to me, you've got to invest in some guys. I said, Mm. why? They don't make any money. These women have made me all this money. Look at all these deals I've made so much money in. Why should I take risk with men who can't, who don't, who have testosterone sales targets they never hit and all the rest of that stuff. So I'm, I'm very biased about people that understand financial independence, that's women, mitigate risk, that's women, know how to manage time, that's women, set reasonable goals, have very sticky cultures in their business, that's all women. So I'm telling my guys now, every year we do a big conference in South Beach, I bring all my companies together, 50, 60, 70 people in that room, and I say, this is what these women did this year, and this is what you guys did, now why don't you exchange ideas here, because I want all of you to succeed. I'm aligned with you, I've risked capital with you. Go figure out what they're doing. You uh, at times in uh, flirted with what I would consider Canadian exceptionalism, that Canada was a great country and that it was doing a lot of things right. Uh, you know, according to various kinds of indexes of economic freedom, Canada is in many ways more free than the United States, but you're really off Canada. You, re- you pulled all your money out of Canada. You left. I mean, you're, I guess you're, are you still a Canadian citizen or are you I'm, an American I'm both citizen? Irish and Canadian. Okay. I, and so what happened was, um, in the last election, uh, I'm, al- I'm always willing to give a politician uh, a chance, regardless of where they came from or how they got their mandate. And in Canada, they have the parliamentary system. And so when the current prime minister was elected, um, I'm like everybody else. And I wished him the best of luck and hope that he and then would- you saw him wearing that horrible neighbor jacket or whatever. And well, his mandate has been an unmitigated disaster. And not only because of his lack of of managerial skills, but he put in place in a parliamentary system, the mandates of foreign affairs or infrastructure spending or military procurement or finance are really important because they're little mini prime ministers, the men and women that get those jobs. And he brought in a a covenant. He was a very interested in, in, in providing a broad, diverse, but never put competency in any of his metrics of measuring who should get these jobs. For example, he put in place a journalist in the role of foreign affairs. What's happened? Never in Canada's history have we upset so many partners. Saudi Arabia, Japan, Russia, 
China, United States, all our prime trading partners. In the last few months, and I'll give you an example and why I was so happy to have taken my money out when I started to realize he can't manage anything. The worst country to have invested in in the last four years has been Canada of the G7, a disaster. You will, anywhere else would have been better, including Europe. The Canadian dollar's collapsed. It's gone down from parity down to 73 cents. So you've lost your 24% right there. But let me give you an example that, because it brings together the idea of understanding negotiating tactics and managerial skill. When Trump decided to ramp up the trade war with China, when he really wanted to slap on that second set of tariffs, he was, I'm speculating here, but I think I'm right. He was really worried that all of a sudden the Chinese would cut off trade in agriculture, trade in resources, trade in energy, trade in wood. Where would they all go? Up to Canada. That would have been a huge win for Canada. What does he do? He realizes he calls up the finance minister in Canada and says, the Huawei CFO, the daughter of the founder, is going to be in Vancouver for 32 minutes transferring to Mexico City. Arrest her. He totally played Trudeau and the, and the foreign affairs minister like a fiddle and screwed the country. When the Chinese heard that happen, within hours, they cut off ties with Canada, including threatening to kill two Canadians that are in prison over there. No pork sales anymore, no energy, no coal, no nickel, no steel, no wheat, nothing going out of Canada to China. What a brilliant move. Except if you're a Canadian citizen or an investor or a Canadian you know, taxpayer, you realize you just got snookered by a really smart guy and a really incompetent finance minister. It's not her fault. She's a journalist. She, never, she was never a diplomat. The poor woman. I feel sorry for her. She'll be gone. In, in a few weeks, that's what I predict. You mentioned before that uh, capitalism is volatile. Um, one of the risks, and this is, uh, economists like Joseph Schumpeter would talk about this, this is the whole idea of capitalism is built on creative destruction. And there's, you know, industries rise and fall within individuals' lifetime, individual lifetimes and whatnot. That creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of social instability. People worry, you know, I'm, I'm working here in this business, it might not be around in five years, or this whole sector might not be. Um, do you worry about that, or what are the ways that capitalism and capitalist societies, free market societies, can mitigate that kind of dislocation so that you don't get calls from democratic socialists to say, we need Medicare for all, we need universal basic income, we need a social safety blanket that covers everything and smothers entrepreneurship? The best way to dissipate fear is study history. This is why I do it to this day. I keep. I keep going farther back and back with the writings of great leaders from the past. And if you look at history in, in, as capitalism over the last 200 years has destroyed many industries and reborn others, 40 years ago, you couldn't have ever dreamt that someone who sat in front of a screen and wrote code would make half a million dollars a year in their first job. That didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Today, it's engineering. It's, it's probably the best job you can get. And in 40 years from now, or 20 years, or 10 years, they'll, you know, talking about robots replacing pizza makers or cooks and all that. I hope it happens because there'll be a new sector that emerges as a result of this. Men will never and women will never be replaced by machines because they'll always be finding new purpose in new problems being solved. And I trust in destructive capitalism to do that. I don't fear any innovation at all. I fear regulation. I fear burdens in government. I fear that a third of every dollar raised by government through taxes is wasted in every capitalist society. Canada, it's 50 cents on every dollar. The United States is about 33. The less money you give government, the better you're, you're, you're at. It's, there's new cancer therapies that starve tumors. Very effective and very interesting research going on there. Starving government of funds would be a good thing. So you mentioned before that in America, uh, you know, it's the, the system isn't where the social safety net isn't working that well, but it doesn't stop the government from uh, just spending more money and borrowing more money. We're $22 trillion in debt. Why is the debt a negative? Why is the debt a problem? And how do we, how do we reduce the debt or start, you know, because we've been starving the beast in America for my entire lifetime. But the, the beast seems to have a credit card that never gets cut off. Well, as a percentage of GDP, the debt has been 
manageable. And also we're moving to a world of zero interest rates, mm -hmm. which we already have in Europe. And uh, you think that's going to no, stay I around? I mean, that, yeah. But while, you, while we haven't had any pressure in the last 10 years, that's been the straight decline of, of the 10-year mm -hmm. um, cost of money. The, the reason that we may get out of this mess is that through innovation and entrepreneurs and technology and a really robust economy, we keep getting more productivity. We keep inventing things like the internet and the cloud services that make productivity continue to perform. We keep getting better at what we do. And as a result, the economy continues to grow in terms of its total size. And GDP, you know, or debt to GDP mm -hmm. remains constant, even though the absolute debt's right. going up. So I can take, and you can take a little bit of solace in that. Now, do I like the fact that government wastes a third of every dollar? And that's my number. We can debate it until the cows right. come home. Uh, no, I don't. And, and so I'm into this mode of saying, how do you starve government of money? Because that is an interesting idea. Basically, you're le the money's not going anywhere. It's staying in the economy. Mm -hmm. People are reinvesting it, creating jobs, which is way better than what government does. All the stupid things they waste money on mm -hmm. because they have no accountability. And I think in the next 10 years, 15, 20 years, we're going to solve for that. In Switzerland, it's illegal to have debt in your canton. You go to jail for that. They solved it decades ago. Swiss don't run deficits. They don't provide services they can't afford. And every time they want to provide a new service, they actually do a vote of the entire country and ask for it. 8.2 million people. It's profoundly efficient. We could learn from them. Do you worry at all about the authoritarian capitalist model that uh, you know a number of people in the in the seventy or I guess in the eighties people were talking about how Japan had figured out how to manage capitalism in a way you know growth without end that ended poorly for Japan not so much for the U.S. <laughs> China now is seen as a model, uh, you know, and they figured it out, and it's an authoritarian capitalism. Do you think China can continue to c lock down or try, try and screw down more and more parts of the economy, or is that um, kind of doomed to failure over the long run? If, if it remains in its constant model, it'll, it's doomed to fail. Um, if you're, you know, leader for life over there, which he's hoping yep. he is, you need to morph yourself into a global participant that plays by the rules. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of business in China uh, through manufacturing there. Most of my companies, we've moved a lot to Vietnam in the last three years, not because of trade wars, because Vietnam became a lot cheaper, not some cheaper, 30% mm -hmm. cheaper. So we've moved quite a few there and that's been happening for years now. But China wants to play with the big boys. And in order to do that, two things are going to have to happen. It's going to be painful for them to get there. but I need the ability to protect my IP in the legal system there mm -hmm. because I need to be able to litigate when, when my IP has been stolen and I need an easy path to stop it as we have here. Chinese investors that come here use our legal system to raise capital they, and stop you know, IP loss. We need the same. And the other one, and this is why the market doesn't correct even as Trump raises the heat on China, mm -hmm. the middle class there is like investing in America in 1930. It's going to be phenomenal to do business mm -hmm. with, with middle-class Chinese people. I have so much stuff to sell them. I can't wait until this thing gets resolved because it is going to take U.S. companies to the next level. Mm -hmm. There's so much they want from us, from entertainment, media, and content, right through all the technology we have. Once it's protectable, we'll be selling it to them. That coexistence is going to be a very powerful up leg and save China. It's going to save China. It's going to make it a, a, a not an emerging economy anymore. It's going to make it a mega powerhouse. And I believe in the next 20 years, it will outpace the American GDP. But only if it opens up and becomes more transparent. And it, it will. It mm -hmm. will because they actually can't afford what's happening there now. Um, they're, they're really starting to suffer, particularly as companies say, I don't want to go through all that headache. Mm -hmm of tariffs, I'm just going to delay my capital expenditure in China. So the government has to do it all. That's a very dangerous, I'd say they're going to come to the table within the next two years. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. We've been talking with Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank. This has been Reason TV. I've been Nick Gillespie.